It was the summer before my sophomore year of high school. My older brother had just left for college, leaving a box of 80s era VHS tapes in the closet of his recently vacated bedroom. This was actually a renovated loft over the two-car garage which was attached to my parents' house. What my brother, Josh, had referred to as his Mike Siva bedroom, though I never got the reference. Well, I do now, because I googled it as I was writing this. But I digress. I had always envied the apartment-like privacy of my brother's room, and I was pestering my folks to let me have it the moment Josh announced that he was going to an out-of-state school. My mum eventually relented on the grounds that I first moved everything he left behind into the old bedroom. I quickly agreed, and the closet had been the last thing I cleaned out. When I came across the tapes, I immediately assumed vintage porn, but I was quite surprised to find that the entire box was nothing but old, obscure horror films. Mostly stuff with ridiculous titles and dated cover art. But being a fan of these terrible B-grade horror movies, it was actually quite the find. The only problem was, my brother didn't have a VCR. At least, not one that he left behind. And neither did my parents. I begged my mum to let me use her credit card to buy one I found online for like 30 bucks. And she of course asked me what a boy with a Blu-ray player and a laptop needed with a VCR. I explained about the box of tapes in Josh's room and she scoffed saying, I'm really starting to worry. You're always watching horror movies and playing those violent games. You need to start reading more books. Um, okay. Can I use your credit card to order books then? Nice try, she said. I spent that entire afternoon scouring the stores near my neighborhood and I was eventually able to locate an old DVD VCR combo. It was tucked away in a dimly lit section of Best Buy's home entertainment department. I then dusted off a price tag that read $199.99 and I promptly put it back. What the hell am I? A drug dealer? I was walking home and contemplating simply swiping my mum's credit card when I spotted a large black rectangle lying beside several bags of trash. They were laying out on the sidewalk in front of a weird vacant lot. Odds were it was just a busted DVD player but I stopped to check anyway just in case. Imagine the look on my face when I saw it was not a DVD player but I shit you not an actual for realsies VCR. I practically ran home, the old bulky machine clutched to my chest, and me looking like the world's most needless burglar. One of the main benefits of my new room was that I was able to enter through the garage, and I would therefore avoid any possible questions from my parents, who are both middle upper class white people and generally quite judgmental of anything that involved pilfering trash. I hurried up the stairs to my room and I plugged in the machine. It was then I discovered that, big surprise, the VCR which I found on the side of the road didn't work. I don't know what I was expecting to be honest, but this still managed to frustrate the shit out of me. Luckily, I was the type of guy that, when you asked 
who my favourite X-Man was, would answer, Forge. Which obviously meant two things. One, I enjoyed tinkering with machines and... Two, even in this age where nerds were actually considered cool, this guy still wasn't getting laid. So, of course, my first reaction was to retrieve a soldering iron from my dad's workbench and bust that bad boy open. I sat up most of the night, googling VCR repair manuals and watching tutorials on YouTube. Eventually, I located what seemed to be the problem, and in the end it was a relatively easy fix. The only real speed bump was when I cut my hand while replacing the VCR's metal casing and a few drops of blood managed to end up on the exposed video heads. If this had been a horror movie, I probably would have heard an ominous clap of thunder right about that moment, but no such luck. I carefully wiped off the video head, secured the casing, and I plugged in the VCR. And yet, after all of this, I was still genuinely surprised when it actually turned on. The green digital clock style display lighting up as the machine whirred to life. I quickly hooked up the VCR and I dug a tape from the box at random. I slid the movie in. It was called Blood Train and I pressed play. An image appeared on the screen. A static, black and white shot of a dimly lit windowless room. The back wall looked like it was made from packed clay. Aside from the clay wall and a few feet of cement floor, the only thing visible within the frame was this rusty, floor-mounted chair. Kind of like what you see in a dentist's office, which was partially visible to the left of the screen. Not exactly Kubrick level composition, but there was something that began to feel oddly menacing about the shot as I watched it continue, uninterrupted, for almost two minutes. What the hell is this? There was no score or audible sound. Nothing. And if it hadn't been for the grainy quality of the film or the time code ticking away on the VCR's display, I would have thought I was actually looking at a still image. I tried to fast forward, but nothing happened. Hoping that this was just a busted tape, I hit eject and I grabbed another movie. She Snake, the label read. I replaced Blood Train with the new tape and once again pressed play. I blinked at my TV. The image that appeared on the screen, it was exactly the same as before. The same continuous shot of the same clay wall and partially visible chair. I double checked to make sure I had put in a new tape. Then I hit the fast forward button, and again, nothing happened. Same story with rewind and pause. I ejected the movie, and was only mildly baffled when I got the same result from a third tape. For close to a minute, I just glared at the TV screen as my disbelief combined with exhaustion and started to turn to rage. I was reaching to hit eject and contemplating throwing the VCR out a window when a shadow flickered across the clay wall on the screen. I glanced up at the TV just in time to see a balding old man in a pair of grimy overalls stalk into frame. The old man was almost abnormally tall, 
and he walked with the kind of slouch one develops after a lifetime of dealing with inadequately sized spaces. In one hand, he gripped the handle of what looked to be a metal bucket, with several wires hanging out from the bottom. Thin streaks of gore poured from the two hollow sockets where his eyes should have been and stained the length of the man's pockmarked cheeks with streams of dried blood. Though being Sand's eyeballs didn't really seem to hamper the old man's vision as he stomped past the clay wall and then out of frame, leaving me sitting there on the floor in front of my TV, mouth agape. And that's how I stayed for about half an hour, just watching what basically amounted to a particularly boring security camera feed as it continued uninterrupted. In that time, the shot never cut. Nothing else appeared on screen. It was mesmerizing. So many questions ran through my head. Where was this room? Why was that chair there? Who was the old man? And what the ever-loving shit was this? Even then, I would have believed that there was some benign explanation for all of it. Maybe Josh had been working on a student film and used these old horror movie tapes to store his old footage on, and what I was watching was simply unedited B-roll. Maybe someone accidentally left the camera rolling between takes. Three times while filming the same shot. And then, the old man returned, dragging a frantically kicking woman into frame. What I originally mistook for a bucket was actually a helmet-like apparatus that was currently clamped down over the woman's head. The wires hanging from the helmet were clipped to various parts of the woman's body. She continued to flail in vain as the old man used the attached handle to drag her across the room. They reached this floor-mounted chair at the edge of the frame, and a disquieting grin spread across the man's face as he squeezed the handle. The woman immediately began to vomit through an oval-shaped hole in the helmet, and just like that, her body went limp. The man lifted her effortlessly, placing the woman into the chair as he moved just out of frame. He then turned to the chair so that the only thing still visible in the shot was a profile view of the chair and part of the woman's helmet covered head. But something told me that that was more than enough. I had this sudden overwhelming feeling that what was about to happen off screen was something not meant to be seen. This was not footage from some movie my brother made. This wasn't footage at all. It was a window. A thought came to me then, from out of nowhere, clear as someone talking into my ear. Video head. His name is Videohead. I passed out somewhere around dawn, and I groaned at my mother when she tried to wake me up two hours later. She yanked the covers out of my hand, saying, Oh no, save that song and dance for a test or something. You're not faking sick your first day. Apparently, I had completely forgotten that School was starting this week. Are you sure that's today? Yes, I do, and so does the bus driver outside. And the 30 kids on board are all pretty sure that's today too. I went through my morning classes in a half-conscious fog and 
and then I power chugged two cans of Mountain Dew at lunch to ready myself for the big reveal of last night's discovery to my one and only non-internet friend, Walter. I told him everything. The box of tapes, the VCR, the old man who I'd come to think of as video head, the woman in the helmet. And when I was done, he just stared at me with a thoughtful expression on his face. After a beat, he finally said, You saw Brett Marshall's car? No, I didn't, I replied, a bit bewildered. His dad bought him one of those Mustangs for his birthday. Brett Marshall is a douche, I suddenly shouted, cutting him off. I was frustrated by Walter's complete lack of regard for my story and I was more than a bit sleep deprived too, which was enough for me to momentarily space on the fact that I was sitting right in the middle of a crowded cafeteria. A cafeteria which immediately fell silent as everyone turned to stare at me. A humiliated expression appeared on Walt's face as he looked down at the table and muttered, Well, that was unnecessary. You want to say that to my face, you prick? This was Mr. Marshall himself speaking, a guy who was at least six inches taller than me and, as previously mentioned, a total douche. I turned to see him sitting a mere two tables over and, caught off guard by the sight of him, my tired mind could think of no other way to respond. Um, you're a douche? For some reason, this made everyone laugh, which was almost as shocking as the look Brett was giving me. I turned back to find Walter, still looking down and half smirking as he shook his head. You know you're a dead man. The day was a bit of a blur after that. Everything around me seemingly set to half volume as I did my best to go through the motions. I went to the rest of my classes and I filed away in my syllabi in their respected folders. I was so spaced out. I just smiled and nodded when it seemed appropriate. The bus ride home was spent listening to music on my phone and avoiding all the awkward stares. Once I was back at my house, I went straight to my room and promptly passed out. Now, I'm walking down the street outside my house, but then I stop. I stop because I see someone standing in the middle of the street. I see the woman from the night before about ten feet ahead of me, standing in the middle of the street. I can see her eyes through two small holes drilled into the side of the cylindrical apparatus on her head, and her eyes are bright green, quite pretty. She says something. I can't hear what she's saying because she's speaking too quietly. I ask her, what is she saying? And she says it again and again, but I still can't hear her. And then she's gone. Then she's behind me and screaming. I said, it fucking hurts! I was pulled out of the dream to find myself in a nearly pitch black room. I hadn't bothered to flip on a light when I came in and the blinds were only half drawn, letting in just the smallest sliver of moonlight. But before I could even reach for a lamp, the motion triggered light in my backyard came on. Still a bit on edge from the nightmare, I hurried out of bed and I crossed over to the window 
just in time to see a tall figure slink into the shadows, heading right towards the garage. Shit. I grabbed the bat from beside my bed, and I cautiously descended the stairs into the garage. The door, leading out to the backyard, had a square window set into its top half, and as I was nearing it, a silhouette appeared at the window. I immediately ducked down beside the door, pressing myself against the wall and praying that I had not been spotted. I carefully reached out a hand, and I turned the lock on the doorknob. A mere moment later, the knob began to rattle as the figure outside attempted to turn it. A light overlooking the driveway was triggered, casting the figure's shadow across the garage floor. I watched the shadow lift both hands to its face, using them like blinders to block out the light as the figure scanned the garage. After what felt like hours, the shadow finally retracted as the tall silhouette moved away from the window. By this point, my heart was playing a speed metal drum solo against my chest. I didn't want to move, but I had to do something. What though? Call the cops, dumbass. That's what characters in badly written horror movies always seemed to forget they could do and now here I was doing the same dumb shit. Stupid life imitating stupid art, I guess. I patted each of my pockets, hoping to feel my cell phone in one of them but I didn't. Why had I not grabbed my phone before I came down here? Well, because you're half awake and obviously an idiot. I was about to risk it and bolt back upstairs when I suddenly heard whispering from just outside the door. On me, when we're sure. I couldn't make out much of what they were saying, but the first voice sounded vaguely familiar. After a few moments, the whispering began to fade, muffled by the sound of footsteps heading away from the garage. They were leaving, heading towards the street. Long after I could no longer hear either of them, I carefully glanced out the window. The lawn was clear, but something was dangling from the tree in front of my house. A lot of something. It looked like... Ah, shit. Someone had covered the tree in toilet paper. The intense dread that had filled me a moment ago was replaced with indignant frustration as I yanked open that door and stepped outside to get a better look. The sudden kick slammed square against my back and sent me tumbling into a plastic trash can, which thankfully cushioned my fall as I crashed to the ground, scattering garbage everywhere. From behind me, Brent Marshall chuckled and said, Who's the douche now, ass clown? Before I could respond with what I'm sure would have been an extremely clever and biting insult, my parents' bedroom light came on, and Brett, of course, took off running. I climbed to my feet and I brushed a used coffee filter from my shirt as a black truck pulled up to my house. Brett hopped into the flatbed and the truck sped off just as my dad was yanking open the kitchen door. Oh, what the hell? He shouted, and I quickly pointed towards the tree draped in toilet paper. My dad saw this and let out a weary sigh. Fucking kids. The television was on 
when I returned to my room. The screen, displaying the same static shot of video heads lair as the night before. I guess this should have seemed kind of strange since the set had been off when I left the room. But, considering the preceding events of the night, I barely even registered the minor anomaly as I climbed back into bed. It didn't take long for Video Head to show up, entering frame with a new helmet-clad victim. It was a man this time, chubby and kind of short. The guy's hands had been savagely cut off and he held the two bloody stumps up right above his chest in a kind of protective manner. Probably because it didn't feel so great to let them drag on the ground as Video Head pulled him across the floor. Video Head then lifted the man into the chair and then, just as before, he turned it so that the guy was now almost entirely out of frame. After a moment, the man's head rocked back and the part of the chair that I could see began to shake slightly. When sleep finally returned, it was deep and mercifully dreamless. I spent every night that week watching the feed of Video Head's lair, anxiously awaiting his exit and eventual return. A fresh victim, in tow. He would always arrive at a different time, though it was usually well after midnight. And each night, there would be something unique about the victim. One woman was covered head to toe in a dark sludge that looked kind of like raw sewage. And another, a man, had a small machine attached to his mouth with a tube leading out of it that seemed to be pumping a menagerie of vile-looking insects from his body. I talked Walter into coming over that Friday to see for himself how awesome of a find this was. And when Video Head finally showed up that night, he did not disappoint. He entered, a woman's contorted body dangling from the handle in his hand. The woman's arms and legs were hogtied behind her back by a coil of barbed wire, and rabid possum was scampering alongside her, biting at the woman's gnarled and bloody stomach as Video Head carried her across the screen. He shooed the possum away as they reached the chair and Video Head bent to unwind the barbed wire which was holding her limbs in place. Immediately, the woman began to struggle, clawing at Video Head's already severely scarred face. Unfazed by the nails digging into his empty eye sockets, Video Head casually pulled the woman's hands away and broke one of her arms like it was a dry branch. The fight quickly drained from her and Video Head gently lifted the woman into the chair before turning it to face off screen. I looked at Walter and simply said, Right? Seriously, they're not even going to show the best part, he asked, gesturing at the turned chair angled just out of frame. But that's the whole point. Whatever you saw up until now is nothing compared to what you're not being shown. There's nothing scarier than the unseen. Don't you get that? Walter shrugged and said, I don't know. Plus, it was boring up until then. I guess the thing with the badger was pretty cool. It was a possum, dude. Yeah, I liked that part. Anyway, Walter yawned and slowly stood up. I'm gonna take off. I was feeling quite bitter by this point, and I didn't bother walking Walter out. 
as I listened to the door close behind me, Video Head once again came into view as he started back across the screen. Whoa, leaving twice in one night, that's new. As I said this, Video Head stopped in place, almost directly in the middle of the frame. He cocked his head slightly, as if straining to hear something. He then turned to look directly at me, and his face seemed to light up. He grinned at me, and it's worth noting that on a scale of 1 to 10 of bone-chilling creepiness, that grin would have been a perfect holy fuck. After another tense beat, Video Head turned and exited the frame, leaving me sitting there. For about five minutes, that's how I stayed, mouth agape and waiting, hoping that Video Head would return. Perhaps he had simply left something in his car and that little fourth wall break had really just been him spotting a stain on the couch cushion or something. I bet there were stains all over that place. There's no need to panic, I told myself, when Video Head did not return. I made my way downstairs to lock the door to the garage and then hurried back up to my room, grabbed my bat which is why I'm not going to panic. I pushed my dresser in front of the door, and then, just to be safe, locked the window as well. Surveying the room, I remembered Monday night's visit from Brett, and I immediately grabbed my phone. Who has two thumbs in the presence of mind to no longer make cliché mistakes? I said aloud, trying to distract myself from my own increasing heart rate. And at that moment, the backyard's motion-triggered light came on. This time I didn't bother checking to see what had set it off. I could hear the doorknob downstairs, rattling as someone tried to turn it, followed by the sound of breaking glass. I quickly unlocked my phone and dialed emergency. The line rang once, and then a familiar female voice answered, with a faint, Hello? Hi, yes, sir. Someone's breaking into my house. The operator let out a surprised gasp. Really? That's awful. I suddenly realized why I recognized the voice on the phone. It was Video Head's first victim, the woman from my nightmare. There's no one coming to save me, is there? Sorry, sweetie, I'm afraid not. I pulled the phone from my ear and tossed it onto the bed as the sound of whining door hinges filtered in from downstairs. Someone was inside the garage. The stairs began to creak as the intruder slowly climbed up to my room. After all this, I still jumped when the knob to my door began to rotate. The door was locked, but it was one of those cheap residential indoor locks. It only took about five seconds of forceful turning before the bolt snapped open with a loud clunk. After a pause that felt no shorter than several eons, the door finally swung open and immediately banged against the dresser. Video head leaned out of the darkness and into my room, looking even taller than he did on screen. Nearly eight feet would be my guess considering he had to duck beneath the doorway to enter. It was at this point that time slowed to a crawl. 
I tried to back away, and it was like moving underwater. Video had shoved the dresser aside and started towards me. That creepy as shit grin stretched wide across his face. I held the bat up in front of me as he neared, and he easily swatted it out of my hands, which caused me to stumble back onto my bed as he raised the bucket helmet over my head. And then he was gone. What? I lowered the arm I had held up to block my face, and I glanced around to find video head nowhere in sight. I realized I was sitting on something. I reached around, and what did I pull out but a universal remote? The same remote I had programmed to the VCR. I glanced at the TV, and I found my answer in the form of a blue input screen. A single word, spelled out in blocky white lettering, hovered at the top left of the frame. Eject. Without another thought, I unhooked that VCR and I shoved it inside one of the trash cans behind the garage. But this didn't quite feel like far enough away. So I snuck out with my dad's car. Somehow the commotion from earlier hadn't woken either of my parents. And I just drove around, trying to locate the empty lot where I had originally found the thing. I couldn't find it. And eventually I just ended up chucking the machine into a dumpster behind Best Buy. My logic was that their lack of reasonable prices was at least partially to blame for my present predicament, and the least they could do was assist with the disposal. When I got back home, I cracked open my laptop, and I searched Netflix for the most benign comedy I could find. I settled on the first season of The American Office, and eventually managed to drift off to sleep. The dream I had that night, as I slept, I don't want to talk about it, and you don't want to hear it. Even if you think you do, trust me, you don't. I spent most of Saturday cleaning out my room which surprised the crap out of my mother, but my dad was still a bit pissed at me since I told him I locked myself out the night before and had to break one of the panes of glass on the door to the garage to get in. But then I asked if he would drive me to go and get a replacement pane and teach me how to install it, and his mood instantly brightened at the prospect of me actually volunteering for father-son handiwork. After that, I tried to call Walter. No answer. And then my brother, thinking I might ask him about the box of tapes I found. Even though by this point, I was certain that that VCR had been the source of everything. And I ended up only getting his voicemail anyway. I had been feeling weird all day. Almost as if I was hung over from the intensity of last night's events. To be fair, the whole week had been pretty draining, and I ended up passing out at about 9pm while watching Let's Plays on YouTube. Thankfully, that night I slept like a rock, and I didn't have a single dream that I could recall. I woke up Sunday actually feeling pretty good. Walter finally called me back and... I apologized for being a pretentious dick. We went and saw some awful action movie that ended up being thoroughly entertaining in a so-bad-it's-good sort of way. It was nice to be watching a film that I knew was just a film. Sitting there in the theater, 
laughing my ass off at the unintentional comedy gold unfolding on screen. I finally started to feel like it was actually over. My brush with darkness had been just that and nothing more. I knew I was lucky to have skirted so close to danger and lived to tell the tale. But now it was done. It was time for me to return to my boring old regular life. Then came Monday. I knew it was going to be a weird day when I stepped outside and I felt how unseasonably chilly it was. I tried to shrug it off, chalking the cold up to nothing more sinister than global warming. But there was this strange nagging feeling in the back of my mind that I couldn't shake. A feeling like I was somehow responsible for the strange shift in weather. Of course, that was absolute nonsense, I told myself as I retrieved a sweater from my room and I hurried back out to the bus. Who did I think I was? Halle Berry and X-Men? I was still smirking at the mental image of me dressed like Storm as I reached my locker and started to dial in the combination. And then I pulled the locker open and my smirk instantly vanished. There, wedged inside, was the bulky, top-loading VCR that I had left in Best Buy's dumpster Friday night. I immediately slammed the locker shut and several senior girls turned to glare at me. There's like a, a snake in my locker, I said, pointing as I quickly turned and started down the hill to class. All morning, the only thing I could think about was what was sitting in my locker. Sitting there, waiting. Walter had a dentist appointment that day and I ended up eating lunch alone. I found an empty table at the back of the cafeteria and I sat facing the wall as I racked my brain for a solution. Why not just set the bitch on fire? Let that bad boy burn until it was nothing but ash. Then I remembered that, according to the slew of real paranormal encounters shows which I frequently watched, hey, we've all got our guilty pleasures. Mine is just really silly. But anyway... They taught me one thing. You're not supposed to burn haunted Ouija boards because the element of fire actually makes malign entities stronger. So what then? I decided to Google disposing of haunted objects on my phone and I read that I should tie large stones to the VCR and toss it into a running body of water like a river or a deep stream. One site suggested filling a kiddie pool with salt water and submerging it in there if I couldn't locate a suitable natural water source. But I seriously doubted that I would be able to explain that one to my folks. I was searching on Google Maps, looking for the nearest river, when I heard a familiar voice approaching. Brett was talking to one of his idiot friends as they sat down at the table directly behind me. They proceeded to have an inappropriate discussion publicly about Brett's mum catching him in the midst of some, uh, extracurricular activities and subsequently punishing him by blocking internet access to his room. It was the next part of the conversation that caught my attention though. No internet, that's like, what do they call it? Crueler than usual punishment. Yeah, tell me about it. So anyway, I went digging through all this stuff from my dad's bachelor years that he's got stashed in the shed out back. And guess what? I found a straight up box full of porn out there. Problem solved then. Sure, they might be a bit bushier than you're used to, but still. Yeah, the only problem is it's 
all VHS tapes. So, you don't have an old VCR laying around? Of course not. Do you? No. Exactly. Nobody does. Brett grew quiet for a moment, and then suddenly, he shouted in my direction. Hey! Something small ricocheted off the side of my head and I looked down to see a single tater tot roll between my chair. Hey! When I didn't respond, Brett tossed another tater tot at my head. I let out a long sigh as the third tater tot bounced off my shoulder and landed in my jello. What? I nearly hissed as I quickly spun around to face Brett, whose arm was poised and ready to throw yet another tot at me. You got a VCR I can borrow. I tried my best not to smile. As a matter of fact, I do. To say that Brett looked surprised when I pulled the bulky machine from my locker and placed it in his outstretched arms would be an understatement. Here, you can keep it. Really? Thanks, man. I shut my locker and smiled at him. Go fuck yourself, Brett. I walked off, leaving him standing there beside my locker and looking more than a bit confused. When I was halfway down the hall, Brett turned and shouted, Oh, I get it. I spent the rest of that day trying not to think too much about what I had just done. Sure, I felt a bit guilty about giving the VCR to Brett. But then again, it was Brett that I gave it to. Besides, I think we can all agree that he had it coming. Still, I couldn't quite shake the feeling that even a total douche like him didn't deserve to die. But who was to say what was going to happen? For all I knew, the VCR would work just fine for Brett, and he would get to abuse himself to his heart's content. As it turned out, I only had to wait until later that night to find out the answer. I was in my bedroom, actually doing homework of all things, when suddenly, my TV turned on. I checked to see if I had accidentally hit the remote and I found it sitting on the nightstand right beside my bed, well out of reach. I grabbed the remote and I was about to switch the TV off when I saw what was on the screen. It was a handheld, found footage style shot looking in through a window and what appeared to be a teenage boy's bedroom. After a beat, Brett entered the room, holding a bottle of lotion. He locked the door and then tried to turn the knob to ensure that it was actually locked. Brett had already hooked up the VCR and had a tape ready to go. I couldn't see his TV screen, but... The baffled look on Brett's face was enough to tell me that what he was seeing was not what he expected. Though, it wouldn't matter for long. In that same moment, Video Head appeared beside Brett and slammed the metal helmet down onto his head. There was an abrupt cut as the feed suddenly switched to Brett's point of view looking out through the helmet's narrow eye holes. I could see that Brett was being dragged down a dark stairwell and into what I immediately recognised as Video Head's lair. Brett's breathing became louder and more panicked. He glanced at the clay wall to his right and then to the left. That's when we both spotted me. More specifically, a monitor set into the wall 
displaying a shot of me, sitting there on my bed in what appeared to be real time. I reflexively held up a hand to check and, sure enough, my double on the screen immediately mirrored the gesture. To Brett, it must have just looked like I was waving. Video head continued to drag Brett across the room, giving me a quick glimpse at the rest of this new wall which I could now see was covered in dozens of monitors identical to the one I was on. Each monitor displayed a shot of a different person sitting in a room somewhere and intently staring at the screen. Then, video head lifted Brett into the chair and turned it to face yet another part of his lair that had up until now remained unseen. The view through the eye holes was quite limited and it took me a second to fully understand what I was seeing. The wall the chair was now facing was covered from floor to ceiling with eyes. Hundreds of human eyeballs. I assumed this was simply a macabre form of decoration. Trophies from each of Video Head's victims. But then he moved to a small metal table in the corner of the room. And as he did, the eyes turned to follow him. Each pair of disembodied eyes seemed to move in tandem, tracking Video Head's every gesture as he retrieved an odd-looking device from the table. It had a thin handle and two clamps jutting out from it that resembled those things girls use to curl their eyelashes. And he slowly approached Brett. Video Head bent down so that he was at eye level with Brett, giving me a nice long close-up of his gore-stained pockmarked face. And then, Video Head jabbed the clamps into Brett's eyes and yanked. I was expecting the feed to cut as Video Head ripped out his eyes, but it did not. If anything, Brett's point of view became even clearer once it was pulled free of the helmet. The room spun as Video Head turned and pressed the device to a bare spot on the wall behind him, mounting the eyes in place and providing me one final wide-angle shot of his lair as Video Head grinned at me, proudly surveying his work. I hit a button on the remote and the TV switched off, which seemed to instantly depressurize the foreboding atmosphere that had enveloped my room. I set the remote down and I let out a weary sigh. Did I feel guilty? Maybe. Relieved? Absolutely. It was then amid the slew of thoughts racing through my mind, that a single realization hit me. My mum was right. I needed to start reading more books. <laughs> 